from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the African and Middle East Division. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the Division, and I'm really very, very happy to see you all here for this special presentation with Israeli artist Avner Moraya, who will talk to us about his new book, From Text to Image, Illumination, Illumination as Visual Commentary. And I hope it will not be only about the new book. It will be about more than that. As most of you already know, our division, and this is my, my little commercial for our division, because we're webcast and we want the world to know where this event is taking place. So um, our division is made up of three sections, uh, the Hebraic section, of course, the African section, and the Near East section. We're responsible for materials from 78 countries around the world, from the Near East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, as well as from the entire continent of Africa. And of course, for Hebraica, we collect from around the world. We're very active in acquiring and developing our collections, briefing visitors coming from uh, countries, from our regions, and organizing programs, symposia, workshops. We also have uh, exhibits and uh, special displays. Um, and we had a big one, a big uh, exhibit on uh, the Hebrew book uh, a few years ago, which was which brought in uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, to see some of the treasures that we hold here. We are uh, particularly happy uh, to have Avner Moriah here with us today. Uh, not only uh, because we like to invite scholars to discuss um, their productions, their creations, their books, and how they use the materials in the collections, in our collection, other collections, to write their works or to produce their books. But uh, we are happy because um, Abner Moriah's uh, works, his illustrations, focus on the Bible, and the Hebraic section's holdings are especially strong in the areas of the, Bibles, of the Bible and rabbinics, liturgy, and Hebrew language and literature. This section is also expanding its collection of modern artist books on the Bible. And so it is fitting to have Avner Moriah come and talk to us about his journey through the Bible and how he became such an illustrious artist. We hold his beautifully illustrated book of Genesis and have just acquired his most recent. Don't give it away. Okay, I won't. I'm stopping here. I've been stopped, so I do not continue. Okay, so we will surprise you. Let me put it this way. We will surprise you, okay, uh, with a display of, of his books, of his illustrated books, and also of some of our treasures some of our older Bibles, uh, some of the unique uh, Bibles that we hold. So that would be your surprise at the end of the program. And now, Dr. Ann Brenner, the Hebrew uh, area specialist in the Hebraic section, will introduce our speaker for today. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry that just kind of popped out. It is a surprise. <laughs> um, the Bible has been a constant focus of creativity through the ages, inviting scholars, poets, artists, and dreamers to fill in the gaps, flesh out the details, and delve into the meanings. Today's speaker is one of those artists, and today's display a tribute to his unique vision of a biblical text. Avner Moriah is one of the best known and widely collected artists in Israel today. He's what we call in Hebrew a nechis leumi, he's a national treasure. He is a Jerusalem artist. He was born in Jerusalem. He lives and works in Jerusalem 
but his works have reached every corner of the globe and they grace the finest collections, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, the Art Institute of Boston, and many, many more. Uh, here in the Library of Congress, we also collect him. And indeed, his illuminated book of Genesis, as Dr. Deeb just said, it has long been one of our favorite showpieces here in the Hebraic section. Um, we have a special surprise for you today, now I'll say it. Um, as you know, there will be a display following today's talk. Um, and you'll be able to see some really gorgeous examples of Avner's works together with some rare editions of the biblical texts that have inspired him. But what you don't know, because we didn't know until yesterday ourselves, was that we're also go going to be able to display, I think for the first time in America, his new book, his next book in his biblical journey, uh, the book of Exodus. It is absolutely gorgeous and it's on display for you afterwards. So we're so delighted that worked out. Um, it was due to the generosity of the Cohen Family Endowment that we were able to make this really extravagantly beautiful purchase. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to thank them. I also want to thank Ms. Galina Tavarovsky of the Acquisitions Division, who worked some kind of magic in getting this book straight from the binding and into the shelves of the Library of Congress in record time, just in time for today's display. So thanks to Galina. Are you here, Galina? No, well, she deserves our thanks. Um, all great stories seem to begin with a quest. And today we are privileged to welcome Avner Moria into our reading room and hear firsthand about his own journey through the Bible. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Avner Moria. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, I'm going to put my watch here so I'll make sure that uh, we keep the time schedule right. Uh, I'm going to take you through a quick uh, journey through my work and then we will concentrate on the, uh, the project that I'm working on right now. Actually, I've been working on it for the last 15 years is illuminating the text. I didn't start as a illustrator, but I, I came about uh, this project from uh, painting the Israeli landscape and other things. So I'm going to give you a quick run of how I got to where I got to. So what you see here is uh, works of mine from 78. I was a student at Betzal. I, I, I'm a graduate of Betzal Academy of Art and the uh, Yale University, the MFA program there. These are landscapes that I painted in the Judean Hills. This, this is a series that I did on Israeli soldiers in the landscape with the idea of camouflage behind it. The, what got me to work on this subject matter was uh, the, the idea of, uh, of uh, camouflage. This, I did, a, I did a large series on the Holocaust um, and what uh, inspired me there was the movie Shoah. My idea uh, with this subject matter is usually we paint either the victims or the perpetrators and uh, I chose to paint both because by putting the perpetrators and the victims together in one on one canvas, it uh, extends the, the horror that actually took place. Um, the, I, whenever I do a series of paintings, I, I tend to go and do uh, serious research. I went to Germany to look at the, the works, the German Expressionist work uh, that was done before the war, and you can really sense that the war is, is coming. So this is uh, my stadium. This is the dying hall. This is a series that I did on the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Again, I went to Spain and looked at the uh, art that was done in Spain. And what was interesting that right around <coughs> 1492, you see a tremendous amount of uh, surge in the churches that were all 
uh, renovated and, uh, and, and so when you come to think about it, it was either from uh, money or gold that came from South America or money that came from uh, the, the Muslims or the Jews where the church uh, said to them, prove to us that you are good uh, members of the community. So this is looting the synagogue. Uh, for years I've been painting the Israeli landscape. This is uh, Mount Sinai. I actually went to paint uh, next to Mount Sinai and I have a small anecdote about it. Is that when I stood and painted there, in order to get to the point that I wanted to paint, you had to pass a, an Egyptian uh, post. And there was an officer that was standing there and for five days he let me go. After five days, he wanted bakshish. But the Bedouins came to him and said, he's a good painter, let him paint. So I didn't have to pay anything. So that's just a, like a nice human interaction. This, these are all landscapes that I paint on site. These are large canvases, they're 42 inches by 80 inches. This is a sunset over the uh, Sea of Galilee with the with Hamsin winds. These are views of Jerusalem. I'll just go quickly through it so we can get to the point where I want to. This is a painting of my wife. She passed away five years ago. She was the inspiration of my Bible project, the, the, the one that I'm working on now. What uh, got me into dealing with the Jewish text was an opportunity that I got from uh, JTS. I did, I did two large murals for them. Um, the first one that you see here is uh, I did a big project on the gathering at Mount Sinai and uh, when we looked for a place to, to do my mural at the JTS, they said find any place that you want in the building so I chose the staircase that leads to the library and I thought uh, of places that we go up and down in the Bible and I thought of Mount Sinai, because at Mount Sinai we, we got the written word and uh, also, um, so, and, and, and you know, there are other cases of going up and down the ladder, like Joseph, Joseph in the pit or Jacob's ladder. Uh, the number 10 uh, occurred because we have the 10 plagues, the 10 commandments. I thought of the 10 rabbis that were executed by the Romans. And, uh, and I thought also of 10 uh, midrashim that dealt with the gathering at, at Mount Sinai. So the centerpiece is the different times that uh, we went, Moses goes up and down the mountain. I mean, there's more than one story about uh, getting the Torah. And uh, the other uh, panels around are the different uh, points that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, after I finished uh, these murals, um, people came to me and said, oh, you should do a Haggadah, you should do a Haggadah. Now, you know, I just finished the... So this actually work coincided with the first round of my wife uh, battling cancer. And I thought of uh, the Passover Haggadah because we all go in and out, out, out of Egypt. And this is uh, one of the pages that Jerusalem is the center of the universe. Actually here, it's interesting because the image that I used was a painting from uh, Piero della Francesco, a uh, resurrection of Christ, and the resurrection also deals with Passover. This is again an image from the Passover Haggadah. When I, when I did this series, I worked again very methodically. I did uh, many, many drawings, preliminary studies, and then I sit together with my calligrapher I'm totally dyslexic, so I don't even come close to writing text because the letters have their own life. Um, <clears throat> so we design page after page with my images, and I do everything twice. I first do the preliminary studies, and then I sit with the calligrapher, and we design page after page with text and image. These are image. After I finish this, uh, I have a friend in New York. She is a curator of a museum. She said. Oh, you should do something more cheerful. How about uh, um, 
doing some work about Haggadot. Uh, uh, Haggadot, uh, how do you say Haggadot in English? Uh, like tales. So, so I thought of uh, the scroll of Esther because it's. Uh, she thought more like Hansel and Gretel and uh, stories like that, but I chose. Uh, and so again, I went and I studied the, the, the tale of Esther or the scroll of Esther, and I created 76 images uh, where I uh, paint uh, the, the visual uh, story. I, I think one of the gifts that I've been given from whoever gives those gifts is my ability to when I read the text to come up with a set design. That's why I showed you my other works to see how I create like a set design from something that, that is abstract. But if you give me very few details, I can come up with my own design. So, and I work again here very methodically. I, I looked at Persian miniatures, Indian miniatures, and I always make a point about uh, making, that I live and work in the Middle East. So although you could see that there's a three dimension in the, the images, but I also use uh, the two dimension uh, design. Even in my Holocaust paintings, uh, when I did them, I th uh, there are three um, uh, uh, ideas that I had. One is called the, da the Dance of Death. That's a Nordic uh, theme that deals with mass killings. And it was during the hundred year war between the Protestants and the Catholics. Also there's a, a theme, an Italian southern f a theme that is called the Massacre of the Innocents. They actually painted the destruction of the temple. And then I, paint, I thought of Egyptian art because they deal with life after death. And I combined all these images together to create uh, my own interpretation of the text. It didn't make sense at the time to try and uh, copy any of the visuals that we know, the horrific uh, photographs, but to come up with my own, uh, so to speak, hell that described that uh, period of our people. And when you think about it, uh, you know, we have horrors going on right now around the world, and yet uh, we keep on our lives as, uh, you know, wherever we live, we keep our life as it is. So these images are, I took from Persian miniatures. And I also looked at, uh, like the guys at the bottom getting drunk, I thought of Bruegel and his uh, uh, guys getting drunk. The dancers I picked from Indian miniatures. Uh, bringing uh, uh, Esther to the palace, I thought of, uh, um, these uh, carriages that were in France in the 1600s where they were carrying their princesses or in China to the palace. So these are the drunks from Bruegel. These are the dancers. These are the horses. You can see the dancers again. Uh, the image uh, I used, this is from an Indian uh, miniatures, I used the images of Sh Shoshan, the, Bira the capital of uh, uh, Persia. And these are uh, Muslim miniatures that I looked at. Um, you'll see when I get to my scroll of Esther, this is Vermeer. Vermeer always has a uh, a twist in his painting that in the background he, he says something about what, what else was going on in the life. So the map uh, deals with uh, a sailor and this woman is uh, waiting for her husband to come back. This is my, uh, uh, scroll, my scroll of Esther that is actually in the collection of the library here. And uh, when I did this uh, scroll, I uh, it's interesting how the text developed through the works that I worked here. I used a scribe to do the writing, and I surrounded it all around with the text, with images. Here I used a woman scribe. 
but you could see like in the, in the window in the panel to I would say that would be your left where you see uh, King Achashverosh wakes up at night and the images around his room are what actually took place. So there's Haman there sitting and uh, listening to Biktan and Teresh and then you have uh, Haman leading uh, uh, Mordechai on the horse. And also there's the gallows in, in the door between the two guards as a sign to what is going to happen next. This is from a different uh, scroll that I did. Like my, uh, the, the scribes that write the text to send the messengers out, I give them glasses. I mean, they didn't have glasses at the time, but here, uh, this is like the scene where uh, Haman falls on, uh, on Esther's bed. She was a very wise woman. She had no power, no property, but she understood men. And so she made sure when it came to Haman, when Haman gets drunk, he gets into trouble. And that's when Achashverosh walks uh, into the room and sees uh, Haman falling on her bed. And off he goes. This is really an interesting uh, painting. This is a painting that was done by uh, Paolo Cello. And it's a painting about a, a, a Jewish merchant during the period or, um, where, uh, of Passover that uh, uh, the stories with the blood that uh, they uh, uh, actually, so I took this image and if you know in the scroll of Esther towards the end of it, it becomes very, very violent. So I used the image at the bottom uh, to, uh, to paint a scene of violence where they are breaking into the home. These are pages from the scroll that I just uh, completed now. It's uh, the longest scroll of Esther ever done. It's 54 feet long. And uh, I'm going to take it to the Guinness Book of, Pe of Records. And these are some of the images that I did. Uh, I painted the two characters of Bigtan and Teresh being hung. I gave them red outfits like uh, Isis. Here, this is when Achashverosh wakes up in the middle of the night. So I put my two doggies, Mijuli and Blue Titi, lying next to uh, Achashverosh's bed. I gave them gold beds. At home they have plastic uh, beds, but this way I, I made sure that they will uh, become, uh, they will stay with us forever. This is the image of uh, Haman leading uh, Mordechai through the town. These, now, now we're getting to the subject that I was uh, planning to talk about. And these are sources for my visual images. Uh, this is from Egyptian tombs. So uh, you could see the different animals that are used in, both in uh, Genesis and in Exodus. This is from uh, Assyrian wall reliefs that I used also for my visuals. Here, uh, when I painted Noah's Ark, I looked at this image. It's a monsoon flood uh, from an Indian uh, um, manuscript. This is, now we're getting into my preliminary studies of the book of uh, Genesis. And uh, the image on the top is uh, God asking uh, Cain why did his face fall down, meaning why, did he, why does he look upset. So I dropped his face down. You can see it on the top uh, uh, left corner. This is Enoch walking with God. This is uh, my images, my preliminary studies for Genesis the six days of creation. So I did more than one version. Actually, this project that I did, uh, 
I started it as a result of my wife's second round with cancer, where the doc she went through a bone marrow transplant and the doctors uh, played God. So I figured if they can play God and God can play God, so I can play God too. So I created, that's how I got myself involved with illustrating the Bible. And my thought was, you know, instead of feeling sorry for myself to do something productive. This is uh, the expulsion from the garden. And that's what I thought. You see here the ark, how uh, I used the same element of the water that I took from the Indian uh, miniature. Here I compared, this is also a preliminary study, I compared the two buildings that are in the book of Genesis. One is uh, God's, by God's will is the ark, and against his will is the Tower of Babel. So I painted it like a, a, um, an antenna, a communication center today. These are all the characters from Shem, Ham, and Yefet, that, uh, and all the way to Abraham. So I, I just made them up as we went along. This is the covenant between Abraham and God. This is the, the Akeda, the sacrifice of Isaac. This is Jacob's ladder. This is uh, Joseph in the, in the pit. And it's really interesting. When you look at the two motives of the two tales of uh, Joseph in the pit and the Akeda, it, it's very interesting because the motives are exactly the same. In both places, there's a lie. Here we have an animal. Uh, and Jacob asks the sons, uh, how did uh, Joseph die? And, he's, and they, then he, said, he asks them if an, if an animal killed him, and then they say yes, so they're lying to him. Here, uh, Abraham lies to Isaac when, he's, when Isaac asks him, uh, they don't have anything to sacrifice, what are they going to sacrifice? And Abraham knows he's going to sacrifice him, but he says God will provide. So that's the lie here. In both cases, we have another animal that gets uh, um, sacrificed. Here's the ram. And here is the goat that they use for, to cover the coat of many colors. Here we have the Midianites that uh, end up buying uh, Joseph. Uh, we have foreigners. And here we have the youth that came along sitting um, behind. Here they go up the mountain. And here Joseph is in the pit and Jacob says to the sons that he will go to the underworld to look for him. So it's really interesting. Both tales deal with breaking um, basic rules, basic uh, uh, godly rules that the firstborn gets the the, the birthright, and in both cases, both parents give it to somebody else, and the, and so it's really interesting that the two tales are have the same motives uh, uh, in them. Here I, I did a page of uh, animals in the book of Genesis. This is the pages from Genesis. I just wanted to show you uh, how I. So I did all these preliminary studies, and then I sit with my calligrapher, and we decide page after page. This is really an interesting page, because here there's a short mythological tale about the sons of God that come down and mate with earthly women, and God is worried that they're going to live forever, so he limits their lives to 100 years. So I gave them a Canaanite burial. And this is, you could see the development of the flood, where here the ark is coming, towards us where before it was like going across. Here I made the page again with the characters and, and the one in the bottom right is how they spread around the Mediterranean basin. This is the, again the image of the, the Ark and the Tower of Babel. So you see I do do everything twice. I'm not lazy. This is the covenant between Abraham and God. This is the Akeda. Uh, this is when uh, uh, Rivka falls off the camel. 
I want to say about my, my, my images when I paint them, because I painted for many, many years the Israeli landscape, I, I have a nice sensibility and use of colors and, and, and to create, uh, bring them into the contemporary uh, paintings that I painted. You know, during the Renaissance, uh, artists painted biblical themes, but they painted their own landscape and their own clothes and their own setups. So here I brought the landscapes of Israel into the story. This is Jacob's Ladder. Here uh, I used when uh, Laban uh, goes after, uh, when uh, J uh, Jacob sees Laban, he says to him, how come your face is not like yesterday and the day before? So I have his face, I, I gave him three heads today, yesterday and the day before. Here I made a page of all the dreams in the book of Genesis. When we get to uh, Joseph going down to Egypt, I tried to paint it more like Egyptian uh, uh, hieroglyphs. And uh, in the bottom right corner, it says that uh, before Jacob, uh, Joseph uh, um, went to see Pharaoh, he cleaned himself, so I gave him a shower. This is the last page of uh, Genesis. Uh, and there's a development of God because in the first book of Gen in the first tale of Genesis, God is not forgiving. Uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and He kicks them out of the garden. In the last tale of Genesis, Joseph uh, re and the brothers return from the land of Canaan, and, and they're worried He's going to kill them. And He turns to them and said, "I was sent by God to save us all, and endure what I had to endure for the sake of keeping us all alive." This is the page, I also did it in English. Um, in English it's about a third more uh, in length because of the amount of words. I also did some oil paintings as a result of the, my, my project. These are all canvases, Cain and Abel. This is the book of uh, Exodus. So this page, I thought of Moses when he goes and he sees the burning bush. And my idea is that uh, when we uh, study with a professor in the university, they're not, they're smart, but they usually they have one or two ideas that they try to get into our heads and they keep on repeating it over and over again. But we don't hear it till we're ready to hear it. So that's my idea of the burning bush, that Moses, past that burning bush many, many times for years uh, when he was with the Jethro, but only when he was ready to hear God, he saw him. And that's when the burning bush was on fire. This is the gathering at Mount Sinai. Here, I took this image, Vayechbad Lev Paro, that the heart of Pharaoh hardened but in Hebrew, Yechbad means also that it was heavy. So I took an image from the Book of the Dead where the heart, uh, if your heart was heavier than a feather, you didn't go to the underworld. Uh, here I, can, I took ideas when uh, God stops the Egyptians from uh, chasing the Israelites, He uses first fire. And so fire is not a motif in the in the Egyptian uh, culture. It's a motif in the Assyrian uh, culture, in the East cultures. So I thought, and my idea about all these tales that wherever we are in the Middle East, uh, in and around the Mediterranean basin, we all use the same tales. So uh, here I have the Egyptians uh, dying in the, drowning in the sea, but I also use the tale about Moduch and Tiamat uh, Tiamat is going to kill all uh, the lesser gods and her son, and the lesser gods come to uh, to Moloch and ask uh, him to save them, and there's no way to save them because nobody can kill her, but she has seven heads. So he drowns one of her heads in the lake, she opens her mouth, he puts a dagger in her mouth and kills her. When we get out of the story of the crossing the sea, 
we thank God and we're ready to build the temple. We haven't been to Jerusalem yet or to Mount Sinai or any other place, but we're ready to build him a temple. And these guys also, after they're so pleased that they were saved, they build the city of Babel and bring humans to worship uh, Murduch there. So it's not the same story, but there's similar similarities. So I compared the two tales. This is that we were carried on uh, eagle's wings. Here the uh, skinny cats, uh, cats, the skinny um, um, cows eat the uh, fat cows, but also Moses' crocodile eats the crocodiles of the Egyptians. Here I compared the ten plagues to ten Egyptian gods, because every time uh, Moses comes to Pharaoh, he says, uh, I want to go and sacrifice to my God, and, and he doesn't allow them. So, if you can't feed my, if you won't let me feed my God, I won't let you feed your gods. Here I compared the angel of death to the angel that saved the Isaac. So these are some of the pages from Exodus that you're going to see. These are pages from Leviticus. This I call the menu. These are all the animals we can't eat. The non-kosher animals. So here uh, with the uh, leprosy, I used images from Bruegel's lepers. These are, I'm going to show you one or two pages from the book of uh, Leviticus that I'm working on right now. Uh, I painted it with uh, black and gold. That's it. I did pass my allowance, but not by much, but I'm an Israeli, so. I know we all enjoy that wonderful talk by Abner Moria. <clears throat> and I'm sure a lot of you have questions, but we were thinking that perhaps we just invite you back into the conference room for the display. And Abner will be talking about his paintings there with the books right before you. So you'll be able to ask him any question that you like there. So please, let's give him another hand. And then please, let's come into the conference room. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.